Welcome to Author Talk with Richard Lowe. I'm here with Debbie Zakin, who's an award-winning young adult author. Her debut novel is, a, is first in a young adult series from Off Times Publishing. It received first place in the Society for Children's Book Writers and Illustrators Florida Rising Kite 2016 Award. Born in Miami, Debbie grew up in Guatemala and is fluent in English, Spanish, and Hebrew. She currently resides with her husband and her two fabulously trilingual and adorable girls in South Florida. Thank you for coming on the show, Debbie. Thank you for asking me. So, Debbie, tell me, um, tell me a little bit about yourself. Um, okay. Well, I like uh, I grew. I was born in Miami, but I actually did grow up in Central America in Guatemala. Um, I went to a bilingual school, so that's how I have you know, the English that I have. And um, I've always been an avid reader since I could remember. Um, and um, I actually started writing, well, I used to write as a child, and then I actually started writing again um, a few years ago, about six years ago. And, uh, you know, I started kind of just as a, not a hobby, but a sort of like, okay, let me write the story for me. And then I really, really started uh, loving it, and uh, and that's how kind of I got into writing. So. I understand. And why young adult? Um, it was a, it's still a genre that I read predominantly. I mean, I grew up as a as a kid, and in high, throughout high school, I read mostly a lot of classic literature. Growing up in Latin America, I loved a lot of the uh, Latin American literature as well. And that somewhere along the line, um, I discovered young adult, and I really, in really in love, uh, really just enjoyed reading that type of genre. And um, it wasn't that I just decided that oh, let me write a story. It was sort of more like the story came to me, and the story came as a young adult uh, genre. So I understand. And why don't you define young adult so that I understand what it means? Um, okay, I'm not an expert, but um, it is stories that deal with um, basically uh, that stage of life around 12 to about 18, more or less. And there, they, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of genres, but basically the, the heart of it is still the coming of age story. Um, and it's told, yeah, and I think what's different, what differentiates young adult through to um, other literature that might have a, a protagonist that is 12 or 15 or 16 is that it is told through the perspective and the voice of that person, that age. Um, and that's, that's young adult in a nutshell. Are they first person or third person? I mean, most of the, most of the young adults that I have read is first person. It's not a set rule. There are young adult uh, novels out there written in third. Um, but there is something about the first person and about it being such a, I mean, first person is you're, you're seeing everything and experiencing everything through that character's eyes. And so it really does kind of um, make it a very intimate kind of story. And I think that maybe it just fits into the genre. Okay. Into that style. Because you're following around one character and in, in experiencing yeah. life through him yeah. or her. Yeah. 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 Like I said, it's not, a, it's not like it's set in stone. I mean, Authors do all kinds of things, and one of the things that I really enjoy about young adult, especially in the last four or five years, is that it's become very um, almost experiment, exper experimental. Um, um, I mean, authors, there are some of the most uh, different and really unique stories out there are really coming from that genre right now, in my opinion. Interesting. Now, you said it's a young adult sci-fi series. Why don't you explain mm -hmm. the sci-fi part? Okay, so the sci-fi part, can I hold up the book? Is that okay? Sure, of course. <laughs> All right, so I have it with me. Okay, so you can see it's sort of a alien spacey kind of uh, a cover. And um, so I call it light sci-fi because it is, um, it is not, I mean, it takes place on this planet and it takes place in modern times. Um, but there is a, a light sci-fi element to it or contemporary sci-fi is another term that I've heard it used. Um, but it does have uh, a, uh, it has an alien uh, uh, invasion or alien story there, and that's what really makes it sci-fi. But I would define it as contemporary or light sci-fi. Okay. Okay. 
uh, why did you like, you've already described why you like young adult. Mm -hmm. uh, why did you choose sci-fi? You know, again, it wasn't that I, it wasn't a conscious decision, oh, let me write a YA sci-fi story. It was the idea of the, for the story uh, really just came to me, and it just went into that genre. It wasn't something that I, like, you know, consciously decided to do, let me write it like that. It just, the, the, the concept and the story just came to me, and that was how it came. And when you write your story, do you just plot the whole thing out, or do you do um, just see to your pants, write it as you go? So I'm somewhat of a planter or a plotter. Uh, yeah, I'm somewhere in between a, a, a plotter and a and a and um, panster. You know, panter, panster. Yes, thank you. Um, I do like to have. I start with a very basic outline. I usually even start like with a three act kind of outline: act one, act two, act three, and then slowly start building it into a very basic outline. And as as I develop the story in my head, and sometimes even as I develop it in the first draft. I add scenes, I, I move the scenes around, so my outlines tend to be somewhat detailed, but still loose and very flexible. I kind of use it more as a, as a guideline than an outline, really. Okay, and do you find yourself, as you're writing the story, that it changes direction suddenly? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I have had that happen. I've had it happen with the first book, and I've had it happen now with the sequel that I'm in the midst of writing. And, um, and because I, I am, like, again, I kind of, I'm not a, you know, I have an idea of where I want to go, and I still have an idea of how it, how the ending, where, you know, how I want it to end, but if something changes that I'm writing, and I say, oh, wait a second, this changes the entire thing, then I go back, and I adapt the, the outline, and I change it accordingly, but I am flexible in that sense. I kind of do feel that story you know I mean one scene could lead to another and one little change can completely change your, your your entire story and so I do I am flexible in that sense I understand yeah I'm writing a science fiction book and I got about 30,000 words in and then the characters kind of told me I want to go this direction I'm like no no no, no yeah I'm going that way <laughs> and it was kind yeah. of weird yeah yeah and even you know now that I'm writing the sequel you know the characters I, I I see how they have actually grown and how their character arc has has changed. And now I'm like, wait a second, what do you mean you're doing this now? You know, and it's just yeah, they do take a life of their own. And um, but I think that that's uh, I think that that's that's you see that's that's what the story progressing and the characters growing as they should. How long does it take you to write a book? Hmm. I am a very slow writer. I wish I was a fast. I mean. I'm a very slow drafter. I'm pretty good with revisions, um, and editing is usually faster for me. Um, drafting takes me a while. Um, so the, the, this book, this one here, um, the first draft, now granted, you know, I don't have, you know, I, I, I mean, I have children, and I have family obligations, and work, and all that, but it took me probably a year to write the first draft. So, and even though I have more time to focus on the second draft this time, the, on the sequel this time, I still find it that I'm not the kind of writer who will crank out a draft in three months. I wish I was. Um, I think I also have this um, challenge that I like, I, I like to draft clean. So that kind of, it's a good thing because then in the, you know, the editing phase of it, it moves faster, but in the drafting phase, it sometimes kind of really slows it down. I understand how that works. <laughs> do you do you type your novels? Do you speak them? How do you do that? No, yeah, I laptop and typing. I haven't tried the speaking yet. Um, I even know some people who write it by hand. I could. I'm, I'm not good at that. <laughs> um, uh, one, my handwriting is way too sloppy for that. Um, but typing, yeah, just uh, me and a laptop, really. I've got. I've switched over to voice dictation almost totally, and I found my speed went up by four times. Really? Yeah. Wow. But do you go back and change it? Like if you decide, wait a second, I don't want this word. How does, you know? Well, I go back and do an editing pass. Ah, uh, okay. I should try that. I'll try it. It takes some getting used to, just let me warn you. Yeah. <laughs> but, but once you get used to it, I never go back because I just, it, just talk, 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 talk. And mm -hmm. I can talk really fast. And then I go back and go, oh, boy, that was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite memory about writing your book? My favorite memory about writing my book, 
in the process of writing or after it was done or, uh, or just? Your choice. Um, I think, whew, that's a really good question. Um, I think my favorite memory was before I showed it to, you know, before joining a critique group or all the things that, you know, once you kind of have a better understanding of what it really means to be a writer, I showed it to a few, my first draft, I showed it to a few select friends that I know are avid readers and that they like this type of genre. And I actually told them separately, I sent it to them separately, I said, please do me a favor. If this is just like really, really bad, just, just tell me, like, don't waste your time, you know. And then they, all of them came back with, this is great, this is amazing. And it wasn't the, you know, politeness of it because I really, are you sure, are you sure? And I got all this like really great feedback from them that they really enjoyed it. And I think that that was probably the moment I said to myself, maybe I have something here. And I, I don't know if that's my favorite memory, but that's definitely something that stands out in my mind as something that was a switch in my head that I said, okay, so maybe I'm not writing just for myself here. Maybe there's something more here. Interesting. Yeah. Um, how do you promote your books? Ooh, uh, yeah, that's a good question too. Um, I do a lot of social media. Um, Facebook is, um, even though in my personal life, Facebook is actually um, my go-to kind of social media. In my author uh, life, I haven't found it as helpful. Um, I'm very active on Twitter and Instagram. Um, and so a lot of the promotion has been through that, but not the kind of, the, you know, just pop up of like buy my book, buy my book, buy my book. It's really been sort of building slowly um, of interacting with bloggers and readers and other authors. And I found that that's really been one of the best ways to promote the book. Um, now I'm slowly kind of expanding to that and I'm trying to do more local promoting as well. Um, so I have a, um, a festival that I'm attending with uh, about like 10 other authors next month or September, like right around the corner. Um, and, you know, I'm trying all kinds of things. Um, you know, so far what I have had more success with has been really the social media piece of it. But if you have any amazing secrets, please share. <laughs> well, I do have amazing secrets, but we can get into that later. <laughs> um, well, okay. As you're writing your book, how do you? What do you do to remain productive? I mean, if you got you've got two children and a husband and a job, it sounds like you're very busy. How do you stay focused on writing? Um. So I am sort of like a writer. I I, I write anywhere. Um. I always have my laptop with me everywhere I go. Everywhere. Um, and even when I was working like full time, I would uh, sometimes, you know, during my lunch hour, I would go to Starbucks and sit there for 35 or 40 minutes. Um, when my kids were younger, you know, they, I would write during their nap time. I do a lot of writing at night. Um, unfortunately, it seems to be the time when I'm also most productive in terms of writing. I think it's just because the house is quiet and I don't have any other distractions. Um, but uh, I just try to, I do try very much to write every day um, in that sense. I'm, I try to be very disciplined. Although knowing that once in a while, you know, binge watching something on TV is also good for you. Um, and that's sort, of, uh, that's sort of kind of the way I do it. But again, like I said, I wish I could just crank out, you know, uh, 80,000 words in three months. But that's not, it doesn't work for me that way. So... I try to find, you know, even if I can do it 30 minutes here, 45 minutes here, you'd be surprised how, how much can come out even in 45 minutes, you know. And do you have a routine where you, like, close the doors and turn off social media and et cetera, or do you just jump straight in and not care about interruptions? Uh, I should turn social media off. I haven't been very good at that. Um, if I am home alone, I'm usually, well, if I'm, like, during the day, I'm usually writing on my kitchen table. I like to write there. I always have music with me. I, I actually need music to write. I can't write in silence. Um, you know, because I do, I'm kind of like a wandering writer. I mean, if I'm at a coffee shop, I'll also have headphones and music, and I'll write from there. Routine, not a very strict routine, but it, my routine usually involves music and coffee or music and tea or some sort of kind of thing like that. I need music to write, and I need 
either coffee, tea if it's later, or at least water next to me. That's kind of it. That's really it. I understand. And you said you have a laptop. Do you carry around a Mac, a Chromebook, a Windows machine? Uh, yeah, I just have a regular PC. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm not that high tech. Okay, I use a Chromebook and it because it's cheap and it's nice. I just have a regular PC which is a little heavy. I should be looking for options that are somewhat lighter to carry, but I haven't found anything that isn't too expensive and not too small either because some of those are kind of small and not so comfortable to type in. I just have a regular PC. I understand. That's what I worked on for years until I got a Chromebook. But um, anyway, okay. Um, do you get writer's block? And if so, what do you do about it? Oh, yeah, I do. Um, I do get writer's block. Um, I often get writer's block, not often, but when I do, it usually has something to do emotionally outside of writing that is sort of, you know, just life, you know, something going on in life. Um, I, when that happens, I usually try to give myself a break. Um, I'll, I'll read a lot. Um, just, you know, sit then, you know, have, um, you know, a book with me. Um, I will also watch some TV. TV helps. I'll, you know, try to catch up on shows that I really enjoy. And and once I kind of feel that I'm ready, I'll, I'll start trying to write again. But, you know, as kind of go as I kind of go with what I have, with what I can. So if that day I did 150 words, well, I did 150 words. Or maybe I did editing instead of, you know, writing. But I sort of try to push through it, but I don't try to push myself too hard. I kind of feel like sometimes I need to, I need some, some time to get that creative juice flowing again. Oh, the other thing that actually helps me a lot is that um, I'm a runner. And so when I go on a run with music and it's just me and my mind is sort of kind of just wandering is usually when I get my best ideas and I can all of a sudden I'll get an idea. Oh, wait a second. I can fix this plot hole like this. So those are the, my ways of dealing with writer's block. Interesting. Do you find that um, sleep and what you eat and things like that have an effect on your writing? Sleep, probably. Um, like if I'm not sleeping enough, then definitely. Uh, just too tired to concentrate. For me, it's somewhat more tied into emotional. You know, like, um, I mean, I can give you a very concrete example. Um, I actually lost uh, a parent this year. And that was something that really, really was very, very difficult for me to write. So it took me about two months to even be able to just put any words to paper. Um, so it, it's sort of, I, I feel that maybe because writing requires you, you know, if you're writing a scene that requires, you're tapping into emotions and you often have to yourself tap into emotions. And if I'm not in a place where I am able to do that, then I sort of get kind of blocked out or stress stress is another thing just like if it just you know when you're in a stressful situation um but sleep mm, not so much food no i haven't realized i haven't noticed that one i haven't noticed that one okay and what's your favorite thing about being an author <laughs> um my favorite thing about being an author um is sometimes people people's reactions <laughs> you know when you tell them I'm an, you're an author that's kind of funny. Um, everybody thinks that, oh, wow, you know, I mean, that's, that's been really a, a pretty cool to see how people react when you tell them I'm an author and that you actually have a book and um, that I've enjoyed a lot. Um, you know, I, um, I do love just, I love being in my head in other stories, in other places, and I think that's one of my favorite things is when you, when it works and when the words are flowing and when your, you know, when your mind is constantly going there and you want to, you know, when you're doing, you know, you're doing your, your routine and you want to find that time to go back into your story and connect with your characters, that's really the best, it's the best feeling. I see. And I noticed you, you've published with a publishing company. You're not <laughs> self-published? No, no, I'm not self-published. Optums is, um, it's a small micro-publisher. Um, they're actually based out of England. And they, um, they specialize in young adult and mostly fantasy, sci-fi, horror, um, so genres like that. Um, I, they're a great publishing um, company. Um, they're very, very uh, kind of cutting edge. And uh, 
really good with uh, marketing and social media, and I'm actually really, really happy with them. Nice. Now, have you seen your books in libraries yet? You know, I have seen, well, I've seen them when people have sent me pictures. So people, other people outside of my area where I live have sent me pictures of, of out libraries, even as far as Canada, that have the book. Locally, I don't know why I haven't been able to. Locally, it seems to be a little harder. I guess when other people request it, it's easier than when you request your own book. Of course. What about bookstores? Have you seen it in bookstores yet? No, not yet. I have it. Um, it's it's available at Barnes and Nobles online, but it's not available at store. Um, and uh, it is available in stores because my publisher, like I said, is based out of um, England. It is available in some bookstores in England, but um, my where I live, we don't really have a lot of indie publish in indie bookstores. Unfortunately, I wish we did, um, and so it's kind of hard to get in there. We really only have Target and. Um, Barnes & Noble, that's really what we have here, uh, okay. but not yet, yeah. Maybe the next one. Now, if what would you tell other writers um, some tips about how they can maintain productivity or how they can become writers or whatever is on your mind? Um, so anytime people have asked me um, about how do, you know, they want to write a story or they are writing, what do they do, the things that I have always, that I always tell them that have really helped me is one, to connect with other writers. Um, either online or locally. Um, I think that for me, joining um, local critique groups was really, really helpful um, beyond the social media. But you know, when you when you meet other people, other writers who are going through the same things as you are, um, it just it makes a huge difference. And when you find um, writers who have you know the ability or a critique group who has the ability to really give you that kind of feedback that maybe friends and family might not be able to because they're not looking at it through that perspective of a writer and what really makes up a story. It's that, that to me is really, really um, very, very important. Um, the other thing that helped me a lot was finding, aside from the critique groups, the face-to-face -face critique groups, I have three critique, critique partners that I work with who live in different places. And, um, you know, to me, they're my friends, even though I've never met them. Um, but, you know, we exchange manuscripts, and uh, I've worked with them for years, and that is also very, very helpful. I think that those two things, um, because then you start getting real on-point feedback, and you start learning from other writers, and you start gaining a, an understanding of what the process of publishing really, really is, at least in terms of, um, I don't know about self-publishing, but in terms of, traditional or, or small or indie publishing, um, it, I mean, it's, it's, there's so much to learn. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a daunting process in the beginning. Um, so I think that those two things are very, very helpful. And any cautions that a writer should have when they're going into this business? Um, <laughs> know that it's not easy. Uh, know that you most likely will be re rejected a lot. A lot. Know that some people might tell you, even you know, some people in the industry might tell you, well, this is, I'm sorry, but this is not good. But you keep going and you keep learning and feedback is really important and uh, accepting feedback and implementing it in a way that works for you and your story without compromising. But being open to that feedback is really important because we, as authors, as writers, we're, we're too close to our stories and we don't, what we understand doesn't necessarily mean that our readers won't understand. And so I think that being open to feedback is very important as well. But know that it's a, it's a long and hard <laughs> process <laughs> with a lot of bumps in the road. Um, but it's, it's amazing. It's amazing if you really love it. I kind of liken it to I'm opening up my soul and letting people take a look. <laughs> yes, it really is. It really is. I still, even when I go and share my work with uh, critique partners, I still get nervous because it's still, it's nerve wracking to share your work with other people. It really is. But because you're right, I mean, it's, you pour your heart and soul into this. Um, but it, that's one of the things you've got to do as a writer. That's why they say you need to have thick skin to be a writer. It's very true. 
In fact, that have you gone to Amazon and found a negative review that you really hated? So very early on, um, my publisher said, don't look at Goodreads and don't look at Amazon. Don't look at reviews. Good reviews will come to you. And I have tried to do that for the most part. Um, someone also gave me a suggestion of having a sort of like a review buddy, having somebody else who you trust go, con you know, whenever, every so often and check reviews and send you either screenshots or whatever it is of the really good ones. Um, because, yeah, the, the, the ones that, you know, the bad ones could just really very much tear your heart out. And, you know, it happens though. I mean, if you go on Goodreads and you look up any, I mean, you can look up Harry Potter and there will be people there that are like, this is the worst thing. And, you know, so you just have to take everything with a grain of salt and know that not everybody's going to love your book the same way you don't love every single book that you read and just kind of move forward. Yeah, I remember I have a book on and uh, Goodreads. I found this review of it I should never have read and it went on for pages where she was critiquing every chapter and every character and she gave it a one star. I was like, oh my God. You know? <laughs> That's a lot of time to put into something that you like didn't like. Like why not just move on, you know? I finally realized it must have hit some chord with her because she spent, must have been hours writing a review. Yeah, yeah. So I try to remember what I was told. Goodreads is for readers, yeah. not for authors. Um, so that's what I try to do. And honestly, the good reviews, they really have kind of come to me. I mean, that's amazing when you're, you know, on a Sunday and you're just in your house doing whatever and all of a sudden you get a tweet or, or something from, from a reader saying, ah, oh, this was such an amazing book. And, and then, you know, they tag you on like the review that they did. That's really awesome. That's really awesome. Yeah, it is. The first, the first time I got a really good review that was like, oh, Thank you. <laughs> I, know. I know you want to print it on and put them on your wall so you can remember every time you're you want to throw your laptop onto the floor or whatever. <laughs> Do a dance. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's about all the time we have. Do you have any closing remarks? Um, no, just thank you so much for uh, for having me, and uh, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. That's my pleasure. Thank you for listening to Author Talks with Richard Lowe. I've just been talking with Debbie Zakin, who's a young adult sci-fi author. And if you like this video, there will be one every two a week. And you can subscribe down below. Thank you very much. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you.